Right, so this is an artist's conception of a type 1A supernova, the kind of supernova I'm going to be talking about tonight. And as I'll explain a little in the lecture, this is a, a star that's losing matter, and it's uh, falling on this white dwarf star. So it's overfilling what's called its Roche lobe, and uh, that's where matter gets more attracted to this star than it does to this star. Roche lobes are only important because I used to be on a basketball team called the Roche Lobe Trotters, uh, <laughs> where we had Einstein here with his equations. Uh, I didn't know he was so buff. But I was actually on this team as an undergraduate, and I didn't even know I was going to do like supernovae, which I only started to do as grad school. And I didn't know that I was going to do cosmology. So it was a very fitting uh, predictor of what I ended up doing. All right, so what is a white dwarf star? Well, it's a tiny, tiny star uh, that's only the size of the Earth. So this is its size in comparison to the sun. This is a real image of the sun. Um, and these white dwarf stars basically get their start as a core of a star like the sun. So deep down in uh, our sun is a giant ball of gas that's burning hydrogen, creating uh, energy. And as the sun ages, it will run out of fuel and gravity will compress uh, the, the sun uh, in the center to the limit that matter can be squeezed. Okay, and that limit, uh, the Chandrasekhar limit, is uh, set by the, the fact that you can't pack electrons any tighter in atoms. Okay, and uh, ultimately the mass of the sun can be squeezed into the size of the earth and a teaspoon of this matter weighs about five tons. Okay, so this is really exotic stuff that we don't have on the earth. Um, and the remaining outer layers of the sun are ejected into space. Uh, this will be the sun's fate in about five billion years. And the core will be a white dwarf star. So this is what's called a planetary nebula. It actually doesn't have anything to do with planets. Down the center, you get a white dwarf star. And this is the, what used to be the outer layers of a star that are ejected. So the white dwarf is a dead star. It doesn't generate energy. Uh, it can't do fusion anymore. So if left alone, it'll just cool off and freeze solid. Um, so like you can get a solid star. Basically, the star crystallizes, and it's a crystalline structure of carbon and oxygen. So it's a lot like a diamond, uh, but it's the size of the Earth. Uh, but uh, what ha so that's what happens if you just leave it alone. The ultimate fate of our sun will be one of these white dwarf stars. But what happens if you don't leave it alone? OK, if it's in a binary system, it can actually come back from the dead. And so that's why uh, I call it a zombie star. Uh, by stealing matter from a living star, the white dwarf can start nuclear fusion or burning on the surface and, and start increasing in mass. So it sort of comes back to life. This dead star comes back to life by stealing the life force from its companion. Uh, but that, it can live happily like that for a while. But if it gets too big, uh, too close to this Chandrasekhar limit, it actually explodes. So uh, I, I was lucky enough to do, uh, I'm a host of one of these shows uh, called uh, Known Universe on the National Geographic Channel. And one of the great things about this show is that I can work my research into the show so that then I can get animators to make awesome uh, explanations of what this stuff is. So I'll just have a, a clip about one of those. Uh, I think at the end of this clip, we talk about how uh, there's an analogy to a burning building. And that was actually because they were like, hey, uh, we, we heard they're going to burn this house down. Can you work this into the show? And, uh, and I said, I can work anything into an analogy about supernovae. So I, I just start to set that up at the end here. I, I don't think we have time to see the burning house, but maybe at the end of the lecture, if there's time, I can show you that clip. But here's the But if one of these stars is a dead star called a white dwarf, its partner could be in for a huge surprise. A white dwarf star is just the burned out core of a star like the sun. But if a white dwarf happens to be in a binary system with another star, it can actually come back to life by essentially stealing the life force from another star. So it's kind of like a zombie. And a zombie star is the last thing you want to be living with. As a white dwarf orbits with its companion, it steals some of its matter. But there's a limit to how much it can take. 
as the other star feeds it more and more, the interior of the white dwarf rises in temperature and pressure until it ignites in a deadly supernova explosion. This destructive behavior is one of the most common forms of supernovae in the universe. But where else can we see runaway combustion turned catastrophic? Right here on Earth, in the very dangerous form of wildfires. And Andy Howell is about to see how these two endings intersect at the IBHS Research Center in South Carolina. They've set up some kind of experiment here in this test chamber, and it says it's hazardous, so I feel like I need to go in there, see what they got. And this thing is like an aircraft hangar. It is massive. Here, buildings try to stand up to various natural disasters, like today, where it's house versus wildfire. All right, so uh, I have the next a clip there queued up. Can we recreate the A uh, All right. Uh, anyway, I have the next clip there queued up. We'll, we'll come back to it later. But here's another clip from the show. Can we recreate the asymmetry of a supernova Where I got to explosion blow something up. here on Earth? Astronomer Andy Howell is about to find out by igniting some gas-filled balloons. So there's a lot we don't understand about supernova. We know the aspherical nature of the explosion is part of what makes them go boom. I want to see if we can get that aspherical nature in this kind of explosion. So we're building a six-foot acetylene bomb here. We've got this uh, net set up so that people don't have to be there when we blow it up. We've got this remote filling system. We've got some fire extinguishers and a remote detonation system set up. Balloon filled, high-speed camera in place, showtime. All right, here we go. My very own supernova. Commercial break. <laughs> Astronomer Andy Howell is trying to see a huge asymmetrical supernova-like explosion up close. But to get the powerful death blast of a star right, this has to be a monster bang. All right, here we go. I get to light my own supernova. Oh my god, dude! <laughs> Man, that was a bang! Damn! <laughs> that was so fast, it was just unbelievable. <laughs> scared the hell out of everybody. Oh, wow. I felt the explosion, and it felt like I got the kicked out of me. <laughs> that was really like a supernova. All right, hopefully that was the one. Oh, that is cool. That looks a lot like a supernova. I mean, it actually looks better than a supernova in a lot of ways. <laughs> In a supernova, we can see this distant point of light, and we can't really resolve all the details. But here, we can see all these fast-moving bits that are just flying away. That's just like in a real supernova. We often get little blobs of calcium racing out a tenth the speed of light. And you can see there's all these turbulent eddies where gas is turning over from these instabilities you have in the explosion. And this is exactly like what we see in the modern simulations of supernovae. In real life, things are really messy and turbulent and mixed up. We're just starting to be able to do on a computer what nature does when you blow something up. All right, so uh, luckily, this is another great thing about being able to just blow stuff, having this TV show thing, you can just blow stuff up. But then I also got the footage from the high-speed camera that I get to use in my lectures and stuff like that uh, to... Uh, uh, which we actually had to film this, uh, I don't know, four times or something, and so it was evening by the time we got a good-looking one. But in the actual thing, my reaction was really uh, that natural reaction because I, I was really close to the explosion, cause, and they weren't sure how powerful it was going to be. 
So the guy, actually, I was really scared, and the guy setting it up said, it was like Michael Bay's explosion guy, actually, uh, that was rigging this explosion. And one of the other guys said, oh, I've seen this before. I'm going to stand about 40 feet that way behind a truck. Uh, it was nice knowing you, Andy. And so I was like, is this going to be safe? I don't know, you know? And uh, so it was just like me and the, cam- and the sound guy and the uh, cameraman there. And that other guy that you heard on the thing saying, oh, my God, he, he's a camera guy. He knows he's not supposed to talk. But that was just his <laughs> reaction to the thing. And then so actually that, that explosion, where the reaction is from, was so powerful that it whited out the camera. Uh, and it whited out this camera, too. Uh, and so they actually used another ex- take of the explosion uh, to show with my reaction. So don't believe everything you see on TV. Um, But all right, so that's what everybody thinks of as an explosion, right? But that's not actually the way Type 1A supernovae are. I mean, they're way, way bigger, way more powerful, okay? But uh, I first wanted to do that to sort of confront your uh, misconceptions about supernovae because, oh, well, you may not even have any conception about uh, supernovae, but uh, most people have misconceptions. So this is a chemical explosion, uh, and, you know, the fuel is uh, acetylene and oxygen. The time of the explosion is about a second. The energy is uh, something like 10 to the 5 joules, not very much, okay? But in a type 1A supernova, the uh, energy is much, much higher, 10 to the 44 joules, okay? Just incredible orders of magnitude more. Uh, You know, you have to put 40 more zeros on the uh, end of how much energy there is there. And the burning is fusion, so you're actually fusing together uh, carbon and oxygen into heavier elements. and it's a carbon-oxygen white dwarf star that blows up, the time scale to rip apart a white dwarf is still about a second. So this thing just races through the star. But then the light curve actually expands, over the, uh, it, gets, it gets brighter over the course of about a month and then fades. And, uh, but that's not the explosion that we're seeing. That's the aftermath of the explosion. So the power source in a Type 1a is actually fusion. In a few seconds, the white dwarf just gets ripped apart, totally destroyed, uh, fusing carbon and oxygen into iron and nickel, and that's basically alchemy, okay? So the the universe knows how to create new elements from other elements. What people were trying to do for years, they just didn't have, like, their furnaces weren't as hot as a a supernova, okay? So it was a failed uh, attempt at making gold, but gold is created in a type 2 supernova, not in a type 1a. So the gold in your jewelry was created in a type 2 supernova. The iron in your blood, most of it was created in a type 1A supernova. Okay, but that's not what you see. What we see when we see the explosion and we follow it in astronomy, it's, it's actually the aftermath. It's a radioactive decay from synthesizing this nickel, 56 nickel, which is a radioactive form that decays to cobalt 56, and that decays to iron 56. And that process takes about three weeks. So if you could convert that into actual nickels, one supernova equals six no-nillion dollars. Okay, that's six times 10 to the 30th. Um, There's not actually an SI prefix for that. Uh, So uh, it goes 10 to the 9 billion and so on up to, and then, you know, it goes tri, quad, quint, sex, sept, so eight, nine. No-nillion is 10 to the 30. But um, there was a uh, a proposal to make hella the prefix for uh, uh, 10 to the 27, and so that would make uh, one supernova 6,000 hella dollars. So if you don't remember anything else, keep that in your brain, and you'll, you can convert how much nickel there is in a supernova. Uh, okay, so there, uh, these supernovae that we study, though, are really, oh, we have to study them in distant galaxies. There have only been two supernovae of type 1a seen by humans in our galaxy, as far as we know. Um, almost, so all of, almost all of our knowledge comes from supernovae in distant galaxies. So they're so far away that they're just point sources of light. So it doesn't look like that video I showed you where you can see all these details. I was talking about the details we see in simulations because all we see is just a point of light. Okay, we can't resolve the, uh, the details of the, of the supernova. And they're so far away that we can't see the star that blew up. It's too dim. Even if we have images from before the supernova, we can't see the star that blew up. So a lot of our knowledge comes from theory uh, and then trying to reconstruct uh, how the supernova works. Okay, so on the right here are two supernovae, supernova 1994D. Uh, here's supernova 2007AF. Uh, these are in nearby galaxies. These are some of the closest supernovae in the last, uh, well, since we've been looking. 
Uh, but turns out uh, this year, uh, the team that I work on, the Palomar Transient Factory, discovered a new supernova that's the closest supernova in the last 25 years. So it's the closest uh, since we've had modern instruments. And we actually got, discovered the supernova only 11 hours after the supernova exploded, which is the earliest anybody's ever seen a type 1a supernova. And that allowed us to get a lot of details uh, about these things and try to, f and it helped us figure out a lot about how they blow up and what kind of stars blow up. Okay, so from this, we could actually determine the size of the star to, that exploded. I told you that they're white dwarf stars, but that was just our theoretical idea before. We were pretty sure of it, but we weren't completely sure. There wasn't any hard evidence. But actually, we, by observing it so early, we could actually work backwards and figure out the size of the star that blew up, and it turns out it has to be a white dwarf. It can't be a normal star. So that was very exciting. These results were just published in uh, the journal Nature uh, recently. So this is an image of the host galaxy. So now this is the sort of hero shot of a type 1a supernova. The supernova is just a point source of light, but it's in this beautiful galaxy, M101, the pinwheel galaxy. And uh, it's 21 million light years away. So the, the supernova actually happened 21 million years ago, but the photons just got to us uh, starting in August, and they're, and they're still getting to us. So uh, we can't, remember I said we can't actually see if there any stars that were there before the explosion. Uh, but in this case, it's so close, we can actually try to do that trick. So here is the Hubble Space Telescope image that was taken before the supernova, by chance. I mean, people like to just study this galaxy because it's a pretty cool galaxy. Uh, and then here's the after image that we took with the Las Cumbres Observatory telescopes. And you can see if we blow up this region where, from the Hubble Space Telescope image, we, we blow it up right here, there is no, the, the little interior circle is the position of the supernova, and there is no star there at the position of, a, of the supernova. So we can't rule out all the different kinds of stars, but this, this companion star, the star that's losing matter to the white dwarf star, uh, was not a, a, a large red giant. And uh, this is the first time we've be able to be, been able to put direct constraints on what the progenitors of these supernovae are, so that it's very exciting. Okay, so that was what supernovae are. And the reason I'm telling you that is because now we then use these supernovae to uh, probe the history of the expansion of the universe. Uh, so cosmology, we're trying to figure out the origin of the universe and what's making the universe uh, accelerate in its expansion. Okay, so everybody knows Einstein, uh, and he is a major player in all of this. So Here's uh, one of my favorite pictures of Einstein in Santa Barbara, where I live now. So I walk these same beaches and, you know, uh, imagine myself uh, in, the, in his, uh, following in his footsteps. Uh, of course, I'm nowhere near as brilliant as that, but uh, anyway. Uh, Einstein started with the, you know, everybody's familiar with the theory of relativity. You may not realize that his first uh, theory of relativity was fashion relativity, that it's okay to mix uh, plaids and stripes. <laughs> But uh, his real theory of relativity, you probably are familiar with that, uh, okay, I'm not going to quiz you on tensors and so on, but basically it relates the curvature of space-time to uh, gravity. Uh, space-time tells mass how to move, mass tells space-time how to curve, and so this is something like the surface of a balloon is like space-time and, and the Earth is sort of sinking into it and, and, and uh, causing a distortion, and that, uh, so you can think of of, this is like a geometric interpretation of uh, the, the theory of relativity. It's a lot more complicated than that, but that's not necessarily important to this uh, lecture. But what is important is that in the early 1920s, the whole universe was thought to consist of our galaxy, uh, the Milky Way. So here is a picture of the Andromeda galaxy, the closest big galaxy to us, and they thought it was a spiral nebula just a gas cloud within our Milky Way galaxy. Um, and so at the time that Einstein was, was uh, doing his theory of relativity, they, they thought the universe was static, uh, neither expanding nor contracting. It just stayed the same. Uh, but it actually turns out that that's not the case. Uh, but at the time, Einstein, okay, well, this is, this is him in 1922. So you can see by this time he's married and he's a little bit better dresser. Um, uh, he uh, modified his field equations to make sure that the universe was actually static because that's the kind of universe he thought he was living in. So he put in this extra term uh, 
uh, a cosmological constant, lambda here. And that basically says, it's, it's like a springiness to space that prevents collapse. Um, so it says, it says space-time has some kind of energy of the vacuum that's allowable in the equations. And he put it in there because he says, it, well, if you don't do that, then gravity should pull everything back together. And why would the universe be static if gravity should be pulling on everything? Uh, okay, so that's, that's where knowledge was at the time. He was allowed to put this in. He did to maintain a static universe. But then um, something happened. Uh, Henrietta Swan Leavitt discovered that these uh, pulsating uh, variable stars, Cepheid variable stars, take longer to pulsate the brighter they are. And so you could actually use them to figure out, you measure their pulsation, you figure out how bright they are, and you could use, use them to determine distances. And uh, Edward, Edwin Hubble, in the mid-1920s, used Cepheid variable stars to determine distances to these spiral nebulae. And he actually showed that they were not nebulae, not clouds in our own galaxy, but distant galaxies, just like our Milky Way, just like the Milky Way, full of stars. Here are some of these Cepheid variable stars in uh, M100, a nearby galaxy from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, they pulsate like this, and you can determine that these things are distant. So now, we actually know that there are these giant like cities of stars, 100 billion stars in a galaxy like our Milky Way, and they're hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. So as we look deeper into the universe, we see there are galaxies of all types, and the universe is a much bigger place uh, than was appreciated previously. Um, so what, but even more than that, Edwin Hubble figured out that the more distant galaxies have a higher redshift, that means that the, the light from those uh, distant galaxies is actually shifted to the red because space is actually stretching as the universe is, uh, expands. And even more, that the farther away galaxies are, the more they, they seem like they're, this redshift is like, it's like a velocity. It's like they, they seem to be moving away from us. And there's a linear relation between the speed the galaxies are moving away and the distance to them. And uh, that's called the Hubble Law. So what it says is that the whole universe is expanding. Okay, so it's not a static universe. This is kind of like a loaf of raisin bread where you have uh, each, each thing is, starts out at 10 centimeters. Let's see if we can start this animation over again. Um, well, maybe not. All right, so, but anyway, it's, it's like a, 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 oh, there we go. Uh, a, a rising loaf of raisin bread. This one was five centimeters from one uh, raisin to the other, and then it was 10, and then it expands, and now it's 10 to this one, 20 to this one. What that means is the distance from each raisin to all the other raisins is increasing. So it may seem like we look out and we see every galaxy moving away from us, like we're the center of the universe. But that's not true. If you were on any given raisin and you looked out, you would see all the other raisins moving away from you. So this is, this is the way it looks from every position in the universe. But it's a very uh, profound discovery that the universe is expanding in all directions. And so the universe is not static. So you don't need the cosmological constant. So in fact, Einstein had added this to balance his equation. He could now get rid of it. And he uh, supposedly called the cosmological constant his biggest blunder um, because he could have predicted the universe was uh, expanding. That was a solution to his equations, but he had overlooked it. Okay, so he had to write sentences. Uh, <laughs> Lambda was a big mistake. I was not to do it again. Um, but it turns out that we can now use supernovae to measure distances, and you can see them much farther away than these Cepheid variable stars. So we can now probe how the universe expands over time. We use these supernovae as standard candles. We know about how bright they are, and then so we can use them as distance indicators. Like if you knew how bright, uh, say, some car headlights were, then you could measure that brightness and figure out how far away it was. We do that with type 1a supernovae and determine distances and make a map of the history of the expansion of the universe. And in doing that, uh, some of my colleagues uh, just got the Nobel Prize in Physics this year, as Craig mentioned, uh, for the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe through observations of supernovae. Saul Perlmutter uh, was the team that 
I was on, I got there just after the research uh, uh, that they got cited for here. Uh, Brian Schmidt and Adam Race were on the competing teams, but I, I work with those guys now. They're uh, good guys. And there are here these whole teams. This was the high Z team that was competing with us in the Supernova Cosmology Project. There are many more people that weren't uh, in these pictures, but it is kind of fun to see all of my uh, uh, astronomer friends dressed up in tuxedos. Uh. Okay, what, what they figured out, and then what we figured out after the fact on other teams and, and, and subsequent work with the Supernova Cosmology Project, is that it requires some kind of energy. Ah, the universe wasn't just expanding, it was accelerating. So it was actually getting faster and faster. Prior to that, everybody thought that the universe would be slowing down in its expansion uh, from gravity. But it turns out, no, the opposite's happening. It's speeding up. So how can you do this? You need some kind of energy in the universe to make everything expand. Um, and that, that stuff that uh, Einstein talked about, this cosmological constant, is actually, it could be one of the things that's making the universe expand. But we don't know that it's that. So we call it dark energy. It's an analogy with dark matter, where there's some kind of matter out there that we don't know what it is, so we call it dark. Dark energy is just some kind of energy that we know is there, but we don't know what it is, so we call it dark. But they may not be related. They're probably not. But the interesting thing is that when you total up the amount of energy needed to accelerate the universe and the amount of matter in the universe, uh, only a, a small fraction, 4% of, of uh, stuff in the universe is everything you've ever learned about in school. Protons, neutrons, electrons. Uh, that's all the stuff we're made of, what stars are made of, what gas is made of. It's only 4% of the universe. So we are basically the freaks of the universe. We are only a tiny little percentage. The rest of the universe is actually something that we really don't understand. Okay, so there are, uh, depending on what the dark energy, depending on the properties of the dark ener energy, it will make the universe expand at different rates over time. So we can use that to then measure the dark energy. We measure how the universe expands at different rates and different times, and then we see, ah, it must be this kind of dark energy. So, so the possibilities are that the universe, uh, as the universe expands, the dark energy could increase in, in, uh, in its power over time. And in that case, in billions of years, the dark energy will rip apart galaxies, stars, and even subatomic particles. So this would be called the big rip. Uh, this would be this is still happening, you know, hundreds of billions of years from now. So nothing to worry about, but uh, it is a possible future outcome of the universe. Um, another thing is that the the dark energy could remain constant. So that's that corresponds to Einstein's cosmological constant, that uh, that the dark energy is a property of the vacuum of space, and that has the weird property that as the universe expands. Uh, the dark energy doesn't dilute. So normal matter gets diluted. You know, you have a little bit of matter and a certain volume. You expand that volume, the matter stays the same, and so the matter gets diluted. But dark energy, as a cosmological constant, doesn't work that way. Okay, if you double the volume, you actually double the amount of dark energy. And so it is a weird stuff that starts to, to overtake the, uh, the domination of uh, the, ba the matter and energy balance of the universe this dark energy starts to become more and more important. Not as much in the big rip, but it still becomes the dominant thing in the universe, which is sort of where we are now. The other possibility is that the power of the dark energy could decrease with time. And that corresponds to something called quintessence, generally speaking. It's uh, an energy field that, feels, that fills space. And that was named because Plato had four terrestrial elements, fire, earth, air, and water. And to that they added uh, Aristotle added ether, the substance of the heavens. And that comes from quinta essentia, or the fifth element. Uh, which I like to think of as a Bruce Willis-like substance whose power decreases with time. <laughs> so here, you know, the movie The Fifth Element. Uh, here's his box office return uh, over the years. And I, in red here, I plotted the Bruce Willis tracker model, which is as physically motivated as any quintessence theory. Um, it's basically, uh, yeah, something who's, you know, it starts with a lot of uh, energy and then it's uh, not as powerful as time goes on. But, uh, so we, we need to test between those three different, broadly speaking, models of dark energy. There are hundreds of models when you get down to the individual details. But that's what we're trying to test. So we put together a team. Actually, the, the team started getting put together before I got there. Uh, I went to Canada to do this research uh, from 
California uh, because it was going to become the best team in the world to do this. And um, I thought, great, uh, I definitely want to uh, try to measure this dark energy. So it's an international team from uh, people from all over the world. And what we decided to do is uh, use the CFHT telescope here. It has a four meter diameter mirror. It takes pictures every four days. And at the time it was built, this Megacam was the biggest, uh, world's largest digital camera, 340 megapixels. Here's an image. Uh, this is not the moon in the image. This is just for scale. But here's the size. So it's about four full moons was uh, the size of the images we needed to do this experiment. And here is an image. I don't know if we can get these lights in front down uh, so that you can see this better temporarily. But basically, uh, one of the images where you see hundreds of thousands of galaxies in this field at one pointing, some of these things with the bright spikes are stars in our galaxy. But everything else, I mean, only a handful of these things are, are, are stars in our galaxy. Everything else is a distant galaxy. And I'll just zoom in here. And uh, we'll zoom in on one spot. And you can start to see some of these points they start to look a little bit more like galaxies. It's a little hard to see. They're, they're almost little point sources because they're so far away. But some of them you can see are a little elongated. And in fact, we'll zoom in to this one in particular uh, because it has a supernova. So uh, a supernova, we got images over time and put together this movie of, the, of it getting brighter and dimmer over time. So this is what we're measuring. We're taking that big image over and over. And it turns out about 40 supernovae are going off in that image at any given night that we're following it. And we follow them over months. And then when we do that, we measure. Here's the supernova again that's going up. And this arrow is tracking the um, time. And so this happens over months. Supernova gets brighter and then dimmer again. And this is basically how bright the supernova is in different colors. So this is green, and then red, and then farther into the red, essentially. And uh, from that, we measure how wide the light curve width is. That's just how long it takes to rise and fall, the peak brightness, and the color. And it turns out we can then use that information to make supernovae even better standard candles. They're not perfectly standard, but we can make them even better the more we know about their properties. Uh, then we also have to get spectra. Getting distances is one thing. We need that redshift, that other axis of the Hubble diagram. And to do that, we need to break the light of the supernova up into a rainbow, basically. And then you can measure the spectra, and you can measure the chemical composition of each supernova. So it's like looking inside the supernova. That allows you to see what elements are there. And it's familiar elements like uh, uh, carbon, silicon, magnesium, this nickel and cobalt and iron that I talked about before, sulfur. Okay, that, so a, a, a white dwarf star is blowing up and creating all of these elements. Then we're measuring and, and determining what type of supernova it is, but we're also determining the redshift. Uh, as these photons come to us from the supernova, they get stretched out, and that stretching depends on how far away they are. So to get these spectra, we need... Um, uh, big, big telescopes like uh, the VLT, Keck, and Gemini, so the biggest telescopes on Earth. So we actually got a few percent of the time on all the world's largest telescopes for five years to do this project. So in addition to CFHT, where we got the images, we use these telescopes to get the spectra. Okay, and it's pretty complicated how we do this stretch and color correction and everything like that. So I'll just use an analogy. And that is that people's heights uh, are about as good a standard ruler as type 1a supernovae are standard candles. OK, so if you, say, know somebody's average height, uh, you could measure the angle that you see the person off in the distance. And then you could, you could actually figure out how far away they were. So what happens if you just don't know their actual height? Well, you could use just an average person's height as a first guess. And then that would allow you to determine the distance pretty well, but there would be some error associated with that. OK, the better you know the average height and the variables affecting it, the better you could determine that distance. And so that's very similar to how we treat supernovae, but instead of standard rulers, they're standard candles. So here's the average height distribution of males in the US. 
the average American male is uh, 69 inches plus or minus 3 inches tall. So guessing the average is good to about 4%. Uh, and supernova distances after correction are good to about 4%. Okay. But that assumes you know that they're adult, male, and American. But even if they aren't, you can correct for that. The light curve width is a little bit like age. People get taller as they age up to a point. Supernova light curves get wider as they get brighter. So if you knew that piece of information, you could correct supernova light curves a little bit better. And color is, is like nationality, kind of. Uh, different groups have different height distributions. The average Indonesian is five foot four. The average Swede is six feet tall. And so if you knew something about uh, the nationality that somebody came from, you could determine uh, their heights a little bit better. Okay, uh, I should say that this is the average uh, male height distribution, but uh, if you allow, there, there can be systematic errors in supernovae, so we have to make sure we really understand this better. We have to make sure we really understand the average distribution of supernova properties, but uh, there can even be problems when, you're, when you do it for uh, people's heights. Uh, so here's the, here's the real male height distribution, but if you look up on uh, one of these dating sites, uh, okay, Cupid, <laughs> What their people's reported uh, height is, it's uh, two inches taller than what they uh, actually are. And uh, I like this uh, little bit here where if you're close to six feet tall, yeah, you're just six feet tall. You know, nobody ever says they're 5'11", I guess. But basically, this, so there, there are real problems with just allowing people to self-report, and they're the same kind of problems with uh, type 1A supernovae. We have to make sure we don't have these selection effects uh, that skew the uh, averages. Okay, so now skipping about 100,000 hours of work. I mean, not me, but uh, me and a team of uh, 20, 30 people working for many years on this project. Uh, it, a whole bunch of work goes into it, but this is basically what we produced. The, uh, these are hundreds of supernovae, so 242 supernovae at this high redshift uh, in the distant universe here, really far away, uh, billions of light years away. Uh, and then some other ones close by, and on the, on the bottom axis here is redshift, increasing, so the photons get more stretched out, and then this is basically how bright the supernovae are. These are fainter supernovae, these are brighter supernovae. Uh, the ones close by are bright, the ones far away are dim, and we measure this light curve peak, color, stretch, and then we modify, we produce what's called a distance modulus. Don't worry about that, but it's basically just expressing the distance in terms of the brightness of the supernovae. We make these corrections, and then we, we make them better standard candles, and then use them to very precisely put their distances on this Hubble diagram. So this is what Edwin Hubble produced before, but now we're doing it with type 1a supernovae, and we can get a much more accurate picture of the history of the expansion of the universe. And then when we do that, we can measure what's called the equation of state of the dark energy. Uh, it's abbreviated as W, uh, and that basically tells you what this dark energy is like. So remember our different options. Uh, I should say this is the supernova results from the Supernova Legacy Survey, this, this big, res this big uh, group that I was a part of. And these are different other physics experiments. Um, uh, WMAP is the cosmic microwave background, so you might have heard of that. It's the afterglow of the Big Bang. If you measure that, you can determine something about uh, this dark energy. Uh, and this is baryon acoustic oscillations. This is measuring the size of sound waves in the early universe and comparing that to the spacing between galaxies today. Using all those three, all those three techniques together, you can put limits on what this uh, dark energy is. And when we do that, remember, our possibilities were big rip. And if that's true, this little target would have been down here somewhere. Or it could have been that it would be the Bruce Willis universe uh, quintessence. Uh, so remember, the dark energy's power decreases with time. But it turns out that the predictions match what Einstein said with his cosmological constant. He had no idea about dark, dark energy. He thought this was his biggest blunder, introducing this cosmological constant into his term. I mean, as a term into his equations, but it turns out that's exactly, it seems like, what we need to explain this accelerating expansion of the universe. Uh, you can go a little farther and then uh, measure how the universe has changed in its expansion 
whether the acceleration uh, actually changed. So we've got uh, distance, velocity, acceleration, and then is the acceleration accelerating, basically? Uh, the universe only started to speed up during the past five billion years or so. Before that, galaxies were close enough so that matter dominated. So matter was, galaxies were close enough so that the gravity was the most important thing. And then as they got farther apart, dark energy started to take over and, and that uh, changed the way the universe was expanding. So we see this uh, change in acceleration in the supernova data. Uh, that change in acceleration is called a jerk and uh, that led to an, uh, this unfortunate headline in the New York Times, uh, the cosmic jerk that reversed the universe, which had Adam Reese's picture uh, <laughs> under it. Uh, it wasn't referring to him, but, uh, you know, it's okay. He, he got a Nobel Prize, so, you know, he can... It's quite all right. Uh, dark energy... Okay, so what, what is, what's going to happen in the future of the expansion of the universe? Well... Dark energy is uh, already dominating the expansion of the universe today, but in the far future, say 100 billion years, almost all galaxies will have expanded past the cosmic horizon, uh, and that's the, the limit we can see. Uh, the only ones we'll be able to see are the ones gravitationally bound to ours, the ones in the local group of galaxies, and that is if this dark energy is, is acts like the cosmological constants. So future astronomers won't be able to know the true nature of the universe except for trusting us uh, because we live in this special time where we can see all of these other galaxies. Um, but, you know, at that point, they'll be like, oh, if this knowledge is even around, they'll be like, oh, billions of years ago, people used to think this, they were a weird superstitious group that didn't know anything about, you know, astronomy. Now we really know. And they, they, they so they may not know exactly how the universe, the, the true nature of the universe, which does make you wonder, what are we missing today? And I don't know. That's a philosophical question. But uh, what I do know is that uh, after 70 years of mystery, uh, we are finally making progress determining the kinds of stars that blew up as thermonuclear as type 1a supernovae. Uh, and we are the real oddballs of the universe. Most of the rest of the universe... 95, 96% of the universe is this mysterious stuff. Some of it's dark matter and some of it's dark energy. And so it's kind of like this jelly bean jar here where um, most of the, of the stuff in it is my this mysterious black stuff, dark stuff, uh, and, and we are just the, the tiny little oddballs. Um, the universe is also not just expanding. People always get these confused. Uh, expanding is what Hubble figured out but it's also accelerating. That's what the Nobel Prize was for. Um, so there seems to be some kind of anti-gravity force that works over large distances in the universe. And a good way to think about this is that uh, people say, well, is there dark energy, say, in this room? Well, the amount of dark energy in an average uh, volume of space of about a meter on a side, so like a yardstick on a side, that kind of cube, the amount of dark energy is about equivalent to about a few atoms of hydrogen, okay, if you, equals mc squared, so you can mass and energy, you know, you can interchange between the two. So that's about how much energy there is in a cubic meter of space, but think about how many actual molecules of hydrogen or, well, oxygen or nitrogen in, the, in this room there are. So all of that totally dominates on Earth. It's really only over these huge, vast distances where you don't have a lot of other stuff, you just have this void of space that actually has a tiny little bit of energy in each cubic meter, but when you sum up the great distances in the universe, that's the dominant thing on big, big scales. Um, you know, our brains did not evolve to understand this stuff because they didn't need to, right? We just needed to evolve to pick berries and, and run from our predators and stuff like that, right? But uh, this other stuff is out there, and we've finally gotten smart enough to use trickery to be able to find it. Um, so space-time is filled with this strange energy whose density stays constant as the universe expands. It is a weird, weird stuff. It is something that we are not naturally sort of evolved to understand. And uh, the properties of it will ultimately dominate the universe. So that's all I wanted to say. And I will end with some acknowledgments. I want to thank all of my, the people on the Supernova Legacy team. It's a big team of us that uh, worked on figuring a lot of this out. But it was also... 
uh, these other teams that got the Nobel Prize and uh, also we're continuing this work at low redshift with the, the uh, Palomar Transient Factory, but uh, and then I'm also a part of this institution, Las Cumbres Observatory, uh, that uh, Craig talked about. And then there was this known universe, people uh, that I, I'm indebted to as well. But I especially want to point out uh, that all my teachers, professors, and mentors uh, really, you know, put me into this state where I can now probe cool stuff about the universe. Uh, Mr. Sweeser was my eighth grade teacher who got me excited about uh, astronomy. And uh, uh, Mr. Rushing was a history teacher, but really believed in me and told me I could do cool, fun stuff. Mr. Hoffman taught me physics in 11th grade and really, really well. Ms. Madison taught me calculus. Then uh, these, these uh, characters, Craig, Saul, and Ray, were my mentors as, uh, um, as I got older in, in a university environment. And, uh, I also want to say this is uh, dedicated to memory of uh, Richard Sweetser, who was my eighth grade teacher, uh, who died subsequently, and Wei Dong Lee, who was one of the authors on this uh, uh, paper I talked about with the Hubble Space Telescope, where we, we saw that there, it wasn't a red giant. Uh, he unfortunately died a couple of days before that paper came out. So uh, with that, I say thank you, and I'll take questions. Thanks, Sandy. Um, we will have a microphone set up right here, so if you have questions, I'd like you to come down the aisle here and line up, and let's hear what you have to say. Right. Take it away. Yes, sir. Have the uh, Planck uh, satellite results pr produced any new evidence or any new insights yet? Yeah, had the, has the Planck satellite produced any new results, new evidence? So this is a satellite that is probing the cosmic microwave background, and it does have data, and they do have results, but they just haven't announced the results yet. So none of us know uh, what the answer is uh, from it, but uh, they will be coming out with new awesome stuff uh, very soon. So the results I showed were for WMAP, which is a precursor satellite, which are the best results that are currently available. How do the white dwarf stars form and now they make explosions? How do the white dwarf stars form and then how do they make explosions? Yeah. Yeah, they, they form because they are in the, 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 the core of stars like the sun. And so they're basically the, the interior of the, of the uh, sun. And it happens because... The sun props itself up from collapsing because of nuclear burning, because it's doing fusion, and that prevents it from collapsing. Uh, but when you run out of, of energy, basically, you squeeze everything down into this weird, weird state of uh, matter. It's called degenerate matter, and that's what a white dwarf star is. And then what, what makes them explode is that if they... And the other one was how big was it? How big, how big are white dwarf stars? Yeah. Yeah, they're... they're Oh, how big are the explosions? They're more powerful than you can imagine, basically. Like, uh, none of your human experience could prepare you for how, how powerful they are. They're so powerful that you can see them all the way across the other side of the known universe, basically. So, nine billion light years away, we can see these explosions. They're more powerful than a hundred billion suns. Well, not quite a hundred billion, but... Uh, there, 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 maybe uh, 12 billion suns or something like that. But it's basically like most of the stars in the galaxy shining at once, uh, but it's one star, and that blew up. So they're super, super powerful. Stars make elements. So how many elements do the white door stars make before they explode? Yeah, that's a good question. How many elements do the white dwarf stars make? Uh, before they explode. What's actually during the explosion that they make all of these elements. So you start off with mostly carbon and oxygen and you end up with all of these things that I mentioned, sulfur, silicon, calcium, magnesium, uh, iron, nickel, cobalt, and that's in a type 1a supernova. Uh, and that, other stars produce elements as well, but in a type 1a supernova, that's what you make. In type 2 supernovae, you can make even heavier elements up to, say, gold and these other things that I talked about. But basically, the Big Bang just made hydrogen and helium and some trace other little very light things. Everything else was created either in the heart of a star or in a supernova. Okay. 
All right, well, first, thanks very much for uh, uh, making a, a non-scientist have a little bit of understanding of what's going on. Uh, I have a question about, uh, so if I understand what, what you're talking about, so you can use now supernova to understand, uh, better understand distance um, and understand some of the nature of, of that. How does that then uh, fold into, or does it fold into anything to do with the multiverse and Bi Brian Greene's ideas around that and chaos theory? Yeah, what do we know about the multiverse uh, is the question. And, and one of the motivations for that is that there are these seemingly finely tuned physical parameters of the universe. If the universe was a little bit different, it wouldn't exist so that we could evolve and ask these questions about it. And so you could imagine hundreds, millions even, of different universes that all have slightly different parameters, and we just happen to live in the one that evolved us and so that we can ask these questions. Uh, and these things get into ideas of, of string theory in particular is, is one kind of theory that uh, the multiverse really works well uh, with this idea of a multiverse. Um, it's, it's very speculative. It could be true. It solves some problems that we don't know how to uh, solve, but there's no evidence for it. And so uh, people are trying to come up with ways of, of testing that, but it's very, very difficult. So I tend to stick to these topics that uh, I know I can address in my lifetime and uh, make some progress on those, but that's a good one. I mean, it's not, it's not crazy out there. It's, it's something that very well could be true, but it's very, very hard to probe. In relation to the speed of light, how fast is dark energy expanding the universe? That's a good question. So in, in relation to the speed of light, how fast is dark energy expanding the universe? So um, it turns out that the expansion of the universe does not, is not truly limited by the speed of light. And so if you looked at two galaxies very far apart, it might sort of seem like they're moving faster than the speed of light. They're not really, because it's really just the expansion of space in between them that's pushing them away. It's not a true velocity that these galaxies are, are moving. Um, they still fundamentally are limited by general relativity. So it's still true that no individual thing can move faster than the speed of light. But uh, the expansion of the universe is, it, it appears to behave a little differently, but um, it's, not ex it's not like if I threw a ball or something like that. So really everything is limited by the speed of light in terms of motion as you think of it normally. Right. I'm using velocity as like an analogy here, but it's not truly exactly like that. Um, I, hold on. Um, I have two questions, actually. Um, the first is, whenever I see a model of Einstein's uh, theory of relativity, it always shows um, a mass weighing on like, a piece, like the fabric of the universe, right. which looks like a plane. However, um, because there's, um, I'm trying to figure out how to explain this in a good way, but um, basically the universe is not a 2D plane with three right. balls weighing on it, um, and so what is causing the universe to bend, because in the models it would be like gravity is bending it, but because there's basically no gravity in space except what is caused by matter, what is bending uh, space-time. I know mass is, but um, with the models they give, it's very hard, it's kind of hard to Im imagine what else is bending it. Yeah, it, uh, so the question is, we always see this picture of a, of a you know, Earth, and then there's space-time that looks like this flat plane, and there's something bending it, and that's just because it's an analogy that's easy to, well, somewhat easy to understand, but it's, not, it's, it's very complicated because in a, it's not really what's really going on. What's really going on is that space is three-dimensional, it's not two-dimensional. So, um, you know, in, in uh, Einstein's theory, it's sort of a four-dimensional theory. You have time and you have these three other dimensions. And, and then space is bending in these three dimensions, but then, you know, time is, is in, in there as well. It gets very, very confusing. So we just re reduce the analogies down in dimensions until it's something that we come across in our everyday life. But uh, so all I can say is it's like uh, trying to imagine that, that sheet of a balloon, but it being three-dimensional. There's not a good uh, way of uh, picturing that that I can think of. Um, and then the other question was something like, well, is it mass doing it or something? Yeah, it, I mean, it is mass that's doing it. And uh, I, don't know, I don't know another way to say that, but basically, yeah, mass is what's bending space-time. Those two things are related. 
So it, it's, a, it's a complicated series of equations that the math works out, and we use these analogies to explain it, but there's not a perfect uh, analogy, I think. Okay. Um, actually, that math thing was not my second question. My second question is, um, I've seen, once again, this goes back to the models of relativity. Uh, in the models, they show, for example, black holes creating like a tunnel and possibly creating white holes as well, which shoot out everything, um, whereas black holes suck in everything. And um, I was thinking, if it's also transporting space-time, perhaps, could that uh, space-time coming out of the white hole be sort of like what dark matter is? Pro so uh, could you have something like a black hole that then it doesn't actually just crush everything and there's some kind of white hole that then stuff comes out of uh, and another part of the universe, say... Yeah, like it um, actually takes uh, space-time yeah. and transports it somewhere else. Yeah, it's, if, well, one thing is, uh, we're not even sure white holes exist. It's a sort of theoretical speculation. But, uh, and then could it like sort of shoot out space-time? Not exactly, because the black hole is actually a bending of space-time itself. So you might imagine putting something in and then it maybe some maybe somehow it coming out somewhere else, but it's not space time that's coming out somewhere else exactly. It's it's just whatever matter you would you would put in. But I have to say we don't know that there's anything like a white hole in the universe. We know there are black holes. We're pretty sure there are black holes, but not not like nothing like a white hole. Okay, thank you. You had uh, said that uh, when a white dwarf sucks in the life force of another star, that eventually it would explode would a white dwarf never actually explode and suck all the life force out of another star? It doesn't have to explode. It only explodes if it reaches this certain limit, uh, this Chandrasekhar limit, it gets, if it gets close to that limit, I should say. Um, it, it, it can um, have these nova eruptions on the surface that uh, then blow off enough matter that it never quite, quite reaches the ultimate limit. Or the companion star may not have enough mass to give it so that it reaches the limit. So there are all kinds of outcomes that the, the system could have. Um, it could sort of, yeah, use up the life force of the other star and never reach the, the potential. So calculating that is very difficult, and, but that's one of the ways we would try to get at how many super, what kinds of things blow up as supernovae is. We know how many binary systems there are. We know what kinds do this and that. But it's a very hard way to do it because there's so many uncertainties involved. So if the, if the star doesn't, or the, the white dwarf doesn't blow up, does it become another star? And what happens to the star that it sucked the life force from? Uh, that's a good question. What, what happens to the star that it sort of sucked the matter away from? Um, you get these stars where they, they don't have a lot of, their hydrogen has been stripped away. And so we see different kinds of stars like that out there um, that they're in a binary system, and, and, and that process of being in a binary system stripped the outer layer. So those stars look weird. They don't have as much hydrogen on the outside, or they may have no hydrogen on the outside. Um, and in, in some kind of cases, stars that have lost their hydrogen uh, on the outside blow up as another kind of supernova. Um, probably not in, 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 in exactly these same type 1a systems, but in binary star systems, we do see weird effects like this, where you create weird stars just because there are two stars interacting. Thank you. If the sun turned into a supernova, would it explode the solar system? Yeah, if the sun turns into a supernova, will it explode the solar system? It sure would. But the, fortunately, the sun is not going to turn into a supernova because it's not in a binary system. So uh, a single stars can make supernovae if they're really, really heavy stars. That produces these core collapse supernovae. But fortunately, our sun is not big enough to do that. So it's just going to become a white dwarf and stay that way. But it will, before it becomes a white dwarf, it will become a red giant star. So it will swell up and become really huge. Uh, that's going to, when that happens, it will swallow Mercury and Venus and get close to the orbit of the Earth. The, 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 the sun will be so big that it will swell up and that will destroy part of the solar system at least. Um, fortunately, it's going to be like five billion years, so we don't have anything to worry about. I have two questions. My first question is, how did supernovae get its name? Ah, that's a good question. How did supernovae get its name? Well, there were these things called novae, and that means new. And that was because people saw a new star in the sky. And uh, there, was a, there was a previous 
you know, we're used to just stars. The, the ancient astronomers just saw all these stars there. And then, you know, occasionally uh, people would find some new star. And that's because uh, some, there was some explosion on another star. But then eventually people realized that, ah, there's a special class of these that's way better than novae. <laughs> so we call them supernovae. But they're, I say they're better because they're more fun to work on. But they, they're, 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 it's really because there's more energy in the explosion. And it's a different type of explosion. You blow up the whole white dwarf star, and it makes a massive amount of energy. And so that's, that's how they got their name. My second question is, are black holes actually holes? Are black holes actually holes? That is a profound question. Um, <laughs> Uh, as I said before, we're not really sure if they're sort of holes that then you can somehow go out of. Uh, you could think of them as basically like a kind of star, but a star that's so crushed down that we can never see its surface, or we don't even know what happens down in the middle, because the math that we use to calculate what happens down in the middle of a black hole is basically broken. It doesn't, it doesn't work. It's exceeded our ability to calculate anything. And then we can never see down there because light can't even get out. So there's, there, uh, there, it's kind of like an analogy. It's like a hole because you could fall into it. But it's a, it's a weird kind of hole that you can never get out of. So it's not like any hole on Earth we've ever seen. So it's somewhere in between a star but one that doesn't shine and it sucks light instead of shining light, and a, and a hole, something you can fall into. It's a good question, though. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, today's not the best of days. Um, I have a possibly crazy weird question but I'm very curious about it you said that in our bodies there are certain fusions like that that happen on the Sun so is it possible that perhaps the theory of spontaneous combustion is true if yes yeah. being as if this was possible yeah, basically, it's not actually that fusion is going on in our bodies. It's that the fusion happens in the star, and it creates these elements, and then those elements are in our bodies. But there's no, like, uh, the power source in your body, which is chemical burning, it's just turning food and, you know, changing the chemical bonds in, uh, inside of uh, things you eat. That's what powers your body. It's not, it's not uh, big enough to make you combust. So uh, all of these ideas of, that people have about spontaneous human combustion or whatever, uh, you know, I think it's uh, some other thing like people drink too much and have a cigarette and it burns something and whatever. It's, not, it's probably not uh, actually their bodies combusting. Uh, bodies can't do that as far as we know. Thank you. Sure. Um, what would happen if there was a binary star system and both the stars turn into white dwarfs? Ooh, that's a good question. What would happen if you had both stars that were white dwarfs? Well, uh, we found some star systems like that. So uh, a group of people that I work with at UC Santa Barbara did find two white dwarf stars in a binary system orbiting each other. And you can learn a lot about white dwarfs because in actual... I mean, it's very hard to determine the masses of stars when they're just out in space by themselves, because how do you weigh a star? The way you weigh a star is if it's in a binary system. Then you can actually determine how heavy they are. So you have two white dwarfs. You could, you could determine something about how heavy they are. And then you can see how the stars went through their different phases. They, they, they do weird things in binary systems. And then they, they can produce... Uh, white dwarfs with different properties than you might otherwise get. And you can, you can determine basically a lot about how stars evolve by observing two white dwarf stars. Oh, okay. um, there's something I never really got. Uh, you know how when a, a Dombey star sucks up too much, then it explodes? 
Uh, how does that happen exactly? Yeah, how does that happen? Well, that's a good, you're uh, perceptive because I glossed over all of those details of uh, physics. <laughs> but, uh, so, but you should come to the University of California, Santa Barbara, and sit in on my lecture, and I'll explain it <laughs> in much greater detail. But, you know, I, 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 I'm just kidding. Uh, basically, you, uh, you have a, a, a bunch of carbon and oxygen in this star, and it can't burn because it doesn't have the right uh, ignition temperature and pressure to make the carbon ignite. But when you, as, the, as you add mass to the uh, car carbon oxygen white dwarf, it actually shrinks, okay? It's a weird kind of system, uh, degenerate matter. And as it shrinks, it increases the pressure and the temperature of this carbon until the carbon ignites. And carbon is very unstable under these conditions. And when it ignites, it just blows the whole star apart all at once. So that's a very good question.